everybody yeah joy might be popping on but otherwise. oh joy yeah okay when she pops on we'll say hi to her <laughs> okay hi everybody nice to see everyone so uh in lieu of our big you know three-day extravaganza in indianapolis the court <laughs> <laughs> the coordination team decided that it would be better to break down, break out some of the components of that annual meeting through November, December, and January. So Sue, we asked Sue Weber to, uh, what she could do to help us think about uh, two things, uh, kind of the relation, evaluation and dissemination, as well as sustainability, partly at the hub level, but also how you help congregations both evaluate their work and sustain this focus on calling uh, beyond the time that you're working with them. So she knows that as grantees, we don't have to sustain these projects in our institutions, but the issue of sustain, we want the work to be sustained, you know, this focus to be sustained beyond this time. So uh, she's gonna do this presentation for us today and then give us some work to do, homework to do, for a session in January after the holidays. Okay. Alrighty. So uh, I will turn it over to you, Sue, and she, we can ask questions throughout. So just throw them in the chat and Jane and Jesse and I'll watch those. And then uh, Sue's gonna leave some time at the end. We can just have a general discussion and time for Q and A, but don't, don't hold your questions if you have something for her. And I think you all know her except Janae uh, and uh, Jamie were not there last December, so. Sue is, is new to them. So any other introductory things we need, Jess, or good? Jessica Duckworth, do you wanna just chime in at some point or? Just to say hello, thank you all hello. for being present. <laughs> I'm delighted to see faces and wish we could all be together, but this is the best way. So this is the best my way. deep, deep thanks to Kathleen and Jesse and Jane and to Sue for leading us in the conversation. Sure. Well, good. Well, welcome, everybody. It's good to be with you on this afternoon. I hope you're all well. Uh, I trust uh, you and your loved ones are all safe um, as this pandemic keeps escalating everywhere we go, especially if you're in the Midwest right now. We are the hottest red color on the map, I guess. <laughs> um, so today, as Kathleen indicated, uh, and through all the email exchanges, we're going to talk about sustainability. So today is more of an overview, kind of a theoretical, what we mean by sustainability and the, the various elements that go into it. Um, as Kathleen indicated, um, I welcome your questions as they come to mind. So put them in the chat and we'll, we'll track them. And if we can't get them to them at that particular moment, uh, we will certainly circle back at the end. We'll, we'll um, provide enough time at the end to just have a conversation. Uh, but I'd like for this really to be a conversation among all of us. I'm gonna show a, a bunch of slides uh, that just reinforce the theory. Uh, I believe there were two documents that were sent to you as well. Uh, so we'll, re we'll reference all of those. Um, but um, really, if this is your time. Uh, we wanna know what your questions are, what your thoughts are, and, and perhaps how much have you already done uh, already to contribute to sustainability? Does that make sense? Good, so uh, I'm going to share my screen, maybe, let's see here. So I'm going to walk through these. Um, I can't see the chat because I've got the screen in front of me, but I think you can, Kathleen, and okay, and Jesse. So we're here to talk about both evaluation and sustainability um, from more of a theoretical point of view uh, in order to create strategies for the long-term sustainability of your program, but also how can you can help the congregations you're working with uh, think about sustainability as they go forward. Um, this today, um, hopefully the questions I'd like to explore with you is first of all, what do we mean by sustainability? How do we define that? I think the immediate answer is what? Money? Funding? Okay. 
And how does, and then secondly, how does the work of evaluation uh, contribute to sustainability? Uh, it has a very, very direct link. You cannot do sustainability without evaluation. Uh, it goes hand in hand. And then what factors contribute to strong sustainability? We'll talk about that probably throughout the afternoon. And then uh, just a little bit of how do we assess a program's capacity for sustainability? That indeed will be the homework um, that I'd like to offer you after the holidays. Uh, I don't want to send it as a Christmas present. I'd rather do it first thing in January. And then to talk about a sustainability plan, especially in um, January. So in evaluation planning, uh, if you've read Kathleen's book, uh, Projects That Matter, uh, evaluation planning is something you should be engaged in now and also your congregations. Um, it's about designing an appropriate strategy in order to gain a body of knowledge about what's working and what's not working uh, in order to not only improve your programs, uh, but to be of value to those who care deeply about your work. Uh, for example, from a congregation's perspective, if they've got something going on that is they see a real value and benefit, I could imagine that they could um, share that kind of body of knowledge uh, with other congregations within their tradition uh, or neighboring uh, congregations who might be of interest to it. Um, so there is an audience out there. It's a matter of getting in touch with who is that audience. One of the things that um, I talked about, I think the first time I, I met with you was about creating a theory of change. Um, your programs as a hub really outlined in your Lilly grant proposal um, or back to the coordination program, a theory of change. You said, if we do this, this, and this, then this is going to happen. So in other words, as it says there on the screen, uh, it's the systematic linkages that align your program's overall strategy, what you're going to do and how you're going to do it, uh, with, the, with a larger overarching goal to achieve something of lasting value. And taking uh, from another uh, Lilly uh, program uh, initiative, uh, here we use young adults living and working through the lens of, of vocation. Uh, those were many, many campus ministry programs that help people really reflect um, on their life, uh, their, their life trajectory, and how they would look at it through the lens of vocation. Um, that was the goal, um, but there were strategies to get to that goal. There are strategies in your hub and there are strategies uh, in your congregation. I'm gonna stop sharing that for just a moment and share yet another um, And Jessica, I know you're very familiar with this because uh, we've been working with this extensively, but this is, a, this is an example of a theory of change. Um, if we start on this far left-hand column, uh, you invest a lot of resources, people, money, research, materials, equipment, technology. You invest that in order to do certain things like conduct a workshop or deliver services or create curriculum uh, resources or train people or provide counseling uh, or, or to fund something. I know there's some many grants in this initiative if I'm not mistaken. Um, I'm gonna make this a little bit larger. Um, or to facilitate or to partner. Those are the activities in your grant proposal. And the audience of, of those activities are obviously the participants. For you, the hub, it's the congregations. For the congregations, it's its members. Uh, there may be also other outside clients or other groups, uh, other decision makers and organizations. Um, as you can see, this is very generic. Um, so it, it really, has to be tailored um, to your particular uh, program or project. And then every time we engage in something that is brand new, 
that is in many respects a grand experiment, uh, there are some immediate short-term results. Um, people learn something. Um, and Kathleen, correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe that one of the first things um, the hubs engaged in was uh, theological reflection. Would that be right? Did uh, certainly some did, yes. Okay, mm -hmm. so you, you learned how to do that. You became aware of it. You gained knowledge about how you could apply it. Uh, it changed your attitude if it was a good experience. Uh, obviously, you would learn some skills. You may have an opinion on it um, and aspirations or motivations. But those are the short-term results. You pretty much as a hub learned some things or became aware of some, some things that you could take back to your congregation. Is that making sense so far for everyone? I, I can only see half the group, so I'm just assuming everybody's okay. Uh, then later on in your midterm results, um, it will change behavior. You will adopt certain things. So if a congregation learns uh, Lectio Divina or theological reflection, then that becomes a practice that they engage in regularly and it invites a wider circle of members um, into that. And then the ultimate impact are conditions within either a, a, a parish or a congregation or a particular tradition in terms of uh, church, environmental, uh, civic, economic, et cetera. Uh, those are the larger 30,000 foot things that you hope to achieve um, young adults viewing their life through the lens of vocation. You're changing those kinds of conditions. Um, I have this, I'd be happy to send it to all of you if that would be helpful. Um, but I wanted just to quickly go over that because you have inputs, what you invest, outputs in terms of what you do and who you reach, and then the short-term, medium-term, and long-term have a significant impact on the people that you are serving and a significant impact on the people the congregation is serving. So a well, that, go ahead. I was just gonna say that particular, it was sent to us by Jessica. Okay, good. So this is very helpful for you to fill out as your own activity uh, in reflecting on your program uh, to fill these out. And I'm always available to you individually um, to help you do this. Um, it, it, it's an exercise but it'll be really meaningful when you go about evaluating your programs. Um, and just a, a quick example, uh, one of the things you might do in the short term, if you haven't done so already, um, is measure how, what did people learn? Um, and then later on measure what actions are they engaged in? And then in the long term, impact wise, what difference is it making? Uh, what is changing in a congregation? Uh, what is changing in the whole collection of your hub in terms of how they view uh, various things? I'm gonna go back to my slides. So that, uh, the theory of change becomes very important. And um, again, I would remind you that um, the, the evaluation project through myself can really help you uh, complete that. Um, evaluation answers as we are beginning to uh, reveal here is how has your work made a difference in the lives of young adults and in your case in the lives of the people in the congregations that you're serving? And how do we know? And that's where you collect the evidence. The evidence could come from uh, surveys, perhaps, it could come from interviews, it could come from observation, it could come from reading documents that are submitted to you. And as a result, what claims can we make about our program? And here uh, I am suggesting not only claims about your hub, but claims within the congregation. What can they say uh, about their program and how it's made a difference in the lives of those congregants? And so your evaluation work, however you're configuring it, should be able to help you gather that concrete evidence. 
Uh, evidence of change, is, as we saw in the theory of change, uh, relates to knowledge uh, that they have gained, actions that they take on, perhaps conducting a program, conducting a particular kind of, of activity. Uh, it changes people, people's behavior, and it also changes their attitudes about something. Uh, this is just an example. I think we went through this um, the last time I was with you. Uh, but this is an example of an evaluation plan. Uh, it, and this comes right out of Kathleen's book in terms of the formatting. Uh, you know, what are the questions that you want to answer in your evaluation? Um, I'm sure that there are many, many questions that you have, but to ask the questions that are going to be of value and benefit to help you sustain the program down the road. Uh, we can continue to collect lots of information, but if it has no utility, then don't ask the question and don't collect the information. Uh, really streamline your evaluations uh, to really look at what is it we need to learn in order to, to move towards sustainability. <clears throat> so for example, here, the question would be, what is the long-term benefit of a financial planning workshop? Um, this came from a question, this question came from an initiative that is looking at economic challenges uh, facing pastoral leaders. Obviously the data sources are the pastors, the method was a survey, uh, Joe Smith it will be responsible and it will be conducted in spring 2018. Um, a second question that became very important was how confident in that, that initiative are pastors in articulating a th theology of fundraising? <coughs> Excuse me. Again, the same uh, data sources, pastors and members. And then in this methodology, it was a survey followed by group um, interviews, et cetera. But that's just a very quick snapshot, if you will, of what an evaluation plan would look like. So before you move on, could I, uh, Claire asked a good question in the chat. She asked, uh, do you have any advice about how to get honest feedback on the question of how the grant has made a difference in congregation work, given that congregations may be inclined to give more positive feedback to us as they request continued grant funding? Um, if you feel that that's somewhat of a, a barrier or an obstacle, um, it might be, you you might want to engage uh, someone externally to help you with that, who would be objective, who would be neutral. Um, but there are ways of asking the question um, that, that could get around that as well. Um, sometimes not just asking how it's made a difference, but asking questions relative to the specific elements of the program uh, and measuring that either through survey or interviews. Um, might also reveal some things that um, that they that they can offer you. Um, I, 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 I'm not sure why they wouldn't want to share with you. Is there a reason for that? Claire, do you think that there's some issue that the congregation uh, that's in the way for the congregations to give you honest feedback? No, and I'm sorry, there's a bit of noise in the background oh, here. That's good. No, just a large, I mean, our congregations are generally pretty transparent. It just seems that that evaluation question is asking them to um, give you, give us more textured response. And I just wonder about, you know, following on our previous discussions about how grant and the language of grant may shape our programs and our relationship with congregations, if you've given any thought to just what you said, kind of strategies to get more um, textured, real, serious feedback from them. Yeah, well, I think Claire, one of the things here um, is multiple methodologies. Um, one might be a brief survey followed up then by some interviews. Uh, you might ask people to even do some writing or journaling for you that, that could be shared. And then putting all that together thematically um, rather than, than leaning heavily, for example, on a survey. Uh, I work with a, a lot of grantees who think the survey is the end all be all of evaluation. Uh, and it really has to be complemented uh, in my mind uh, by some other methodologies so that you can really compare and analyze 
why did they say this in a survey and um, something else in an interview? Does that make sense? And I'm sorry for my dog. <laughs> um, here, what we're talking about also, this is again, some theoretical pieces. Uh, you're really raising what are the questions that we want to um, uh, answer through our evaluation, uh, through your investigation, meaning multiple methodologies, uh, you engage in those questions, you receive the responses, uh, you as a team, as a hub, reflect on that, and then look at the work and improve it, um, and then share it uh, with a wider audience if that's appropriate. And sharing indeed uh, is a pathway to sustainability, making awareness uh, of your program. Uh, I just wanted to show you that because really one of the underpinnings of the evaluation project has always been creating a culture of inquiry, creating an, a, a culture of asking very good questions so that we really understand the importance and value and benefit of all the various things that you're doing. So uh, with that little background on evaluation, and that was kind of very quick, but um, what is sustainability and why do we need to talk about it? Um, uh, just on a kind of lighter level, <laughs> a sustainability plan is a conscious response to the fearful dilemma of what to do when your funding runs out. Um, there are many uh, people who come to me in year three and a half of their four-year grant and say, now what do we do about sustainability? Uh, the day you receive the grant is the day you also start thinking about sustainability. And I know you're down the road pretty much, but um, for your congregations, uh, there are still some things that they can think about. Uh, here's a tale of two programs. This is program A. Um, and th this may apply more to you than to them. Uh, but as a hub, you're constantly writing grants to, to, to keep up with sustainability. Uh, you're still stuck on short, short, I should say short term outcomes. Uh, you have high staff turnover. Uh, that's been somewhat uh, of an issue for some initiatives. Uh, a project director comes on and then within a year they're gone and then someone else comes on. That kind of uh, turnover uh, kind of always holds you back a little bit. Uh, there's short-term labor-intensive partnerships uh, with either the organization that you're part of uh, or uh, building relationships or trying to build relationships. Uh, there might be funding with strings attached or there's low credibility with stakeholders. And this low credibility can certainly be rectified by simply sharing um, what's going well in a program. Uh, in contrast, Program B only writes occasional grants uh, because it has been able to secure other streams of income. Uh, its progress is more on intermediate and long-term outcomes, really looking at impact from a longer perspective. Uh, it does have stable and talented staff. Uh, the staff, when it is together, spends time on mission. And I would wonder from your congregation's perspective here um, that they should always circle back to their mission as a congregation and how this program is contributing uh, to embellishing and enhancing that mission. Uh, there's long-term partnerships, uh, funding with no strings attached, and they have high credibility with other stakeholders. So demonstrating your program's worth and value. Are we making a difference? And here I'm talking about the hub and I'm also talking about um, the congregation. Uh, these are the uh, factors in sustainability. And these are also contained in that, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, that sustainability wheel that I sent to you. Um, did everyone receive that I trust? I know Jess Jesse sent that out. Uh, right before the, um, the program here. But it talks about planning and evaluation, funding, progr good program design, uh, partnerships, personnel, um, community, a host agency, and communications. All of these, I'm going to go through these in just a moment, uh, contribute in some way to sustainability. 
So for example, planning and evaluation, uh, really demonstrating the worth and value uh, of your program. And that really goes back to your um, theory of change, the evaluation plan that I just uh, showed you on the screen. Uh, if you have a good evaluation plan where you're seeking input from the participants, from the people who are the uh, recipients of, of the work of, of the ministry, uh, you, then you are able to say what's working and what's not working. Uh, in your program. So good planning and evaluation is an important piece. Uh, when we come back in January, we'll really take that apart in terms of what that means, in terms of how you measure that. Um, you have funding uh, stability. No, in other words, you don't lean heavily on grants, um, but you look at other multiple sources of income streams. Uh, whether they're contributions, uh, whether they're other grant sources, whether they're endowments. Um, I just learned the other day that there was a, an, a, an initiative some years ago by Lilly Endowment. And um, the, the, <clears throat> the host agency believed so much in what they were doing, they immediately started an, endow an endowment for it. Now that's, uh, you know, that doesn't happen all the time. Uh, but, but the leadership of the institution believed in the program even before it was completely launched and said, this is important to our mission and we're going to ensure its sustainability, however that program will look in three or five years. And so an endowment was um, created just for that. So uh, other multiple sources and endowments are certainly one. Um, fees are another, grants are another, all, all kinds of, of income streams. Uh, then good program design, design, responding to a clear need. Again, this circles back to your evaluation plan, your theory of change in terms of not only conducting evaluations, uh, but using those evaluations. How are you using them for program improvement uh, what parts of your program, and I'm talking now of the congregation as well, what parts of your program are working and what parts of your program are no longer relevant. So let's put that to the side and um, uh, really focus on what's important to the participants um, as they continue to participate or as you gather other people uh, to participate in this. Uh, partners, this is another important piece. For some congregations, um, this might go back into their ju uh, judicatory or their diocese uh, in terms of gaining partnership from a larger group. Um, so there's a shared purpose, or it might be a collection of parishes or congregations who come together in partnership because the program has uh, value and benefit for a much wider audience than just in that congregation. But who can they partner with in their area uh, or in their particular judicatory um, or, or district, whatever it might be. So really creating a shared purpose. And again, the assessment tool that I'm going to offer you after, after the holidays will really measure uh, what kinds of partnerships are working or not working. Uh, personnel, we talked about this earlier, stability and leadership and staffing, um, that especially through funding, you're able to keep good staff, you're able to keep good leadership. Uh, you have leadership who believes in, in the program, who can lead with, with mission, and who can lead with strategic leadership in terms of, of how to steer the program into the future. Um, we, uh, let me just say a comment. Um, one of the things that uh, with Lilly Endowment, as well as the evaluation project we've come upon, and I know you have too, is how do we do this programming uh, in a time of COVID? Um, and to really be strategic in what's going to work on a screen and what's going to work um, in some small groups in a room with a mask on, uh, what's going to work? Um, and what I'm really delighted about is we didn't make COVID 
a big obstacle. People really became more innovative and creative in how they did program delivery. Uh, and obviously Zoom, we, we leaned on heavily, but I think all of us, myself included, um, have learned to use Zoom in a better way. Um, and hopefully we will kind of diminish our dependency on Zoom uh, by next year at some point. But really the leadership really looking at that kind of obstacle, uh, like a COVID situation that we're in, a pandemic that we're in, and saying the program is of value and benefit, but how do we, con how do we continue that uh, in the kind of environment that we're in? And I just want to sh just share one more screen to kind of demonstrate that. <clears throat> Can all of you see that? Get a little larger. Um, when I talk about that, it's about emergent strategy, meaning your program, the congregation's program, had a particular way of going about its work. That was its strategy. But as we talk about COVID um, in, in this context, that particular deliberate strategy, for example, Kathleen's saying, you know, we're not together at the Alexander. So there's no nourishment hubs, there's no gatherings, there's no opportunity to, to be together. That strategy had to fall away um, because of the conditions that we're under. And in that came an emergent strategy, a new way, if you, if you would, about how to go about programming, how to go about different methodologies that still meet um, the particular aims that each of the congregations have. And that in turn becomes an important part um, of the strategy of that, that congregation and of this hub. I'll go back to my screen real quick. How did we get over here? I've lost my place here. Uh, another is community. And this really goes hand in hand with partnerships, um, a wider circle of stakeholders and believers um, who believe in your work. Some of that is engagement, inviting them into the program. Some of that is writing about it, um, perhaps journal articles or newsletter articles um, or speaking about it in a public forum uh, with others who might um, be of interest of it. Uh, pastors talking to pastors, uh, lay people talking to lay people uh, in a wider circle, circle of people who um, believe in it, a very important part of sustainability. Um, the host agency, um, in your case, with uh, as hub leaders, it would be your congregations, um, that the congregation as a whole, whatever leadership structure they have, uh, really embraces your, the program that they're in, uh, and they see it as a strategic fit in relationship to the mission of the congregation. Um, if you're a, a hub and you're embedded in a u university, that it is aligned with the mission of the university or the, or the college, and it's, it's a strategic fit. And that the host agency has the capacity from an, a, a number of, of perspectives uh, to um, help you sustain it so that they, they join with you in your sustainability plan. And communications, I just mentioned that um, briefly, uh, really telling your story uh, through good communications, uh, not only, as I said, um, speaking about it, but writing about it, journaling about it, um, promoting it uh, among the important um, stakeholders that you can identify. So just to go back and look at that, if I'm gonna go back to uh, this slide, all of these 
things that I just ran through, planning and evaluation, funding, program design, good program design, uh, partnerships, personnel, community, host agency, and communications. All of these can, can, uh, contribute to sustainability at some level. Uh, for some in a congregation, some of these factors are going to be more important than others, and some may not even be relevant. Um, but I think the point here for, for all of us is that to say sustainability is directly related only to funding uh, is not a wise way to think about this. Um, really to think about it from the perspective of how you gain others, how you widen um, how you widened people's knowledge of this program, invite them in and uh, engage them in the program uh, by these various particular factors that I just outlined. Let me stop there and see um, if there's any questions at this point. Any questions? Nothing so far, Sue. Okay. In January, um, I'd like to send you, and it's a very extensive inventory that takes each of those categories, breaks it down, and helps you assess your capacity for sustainability. Uh, and not just yours, um, but the congregation. Uh, one of the things I, I said to Kathleen in particular, the instrument is pretty involved and I wonder um, what I'd like for you to come back with in January is to help us understand how can we streamline this, um, this assessment tool uh, for congregations because some of it will be kind of, and I, I say this kindly, some of it, will be meaningless to them. Um, so I, I really am going to seek your, your feedback on how we could streamline it so you could apply it in a congregation. I think, I think there's ways to do it. I haven't looked at it um, in total yet, but um, I think there is a way that we could make it simple, uh, straightforward, but at the same time, they can gain information about where they stand uh, with their ability to sustain their program. And just finally, I wanna say through these slides um, to remind congregations that sustainability is um, an orientation, not a destination. Meaning once they gain sustainability beyond a grant, they still have to work at evaluation. They still have to work at strategic planning. Uh, they still have to work at communications. They still have to work uh, with their partners. So it is an ongoing process that really requires people uh, to be mindful um, that evaluation and sustainability continue uh, going forward. It's, it's continued work, maybe at, not at the intensity that we talk about in the beginning, but certainly uh, there has to be good evaluation along the way. Um, and there has to be a really good attention to all the elements of sustainability uh, that I've introduced you to today. So let me stop there and see what questions you have, or maybe to ask you a question. Uh, first of all, does this make sense to you? And uh, what elements do you think congregations are working on relative to sustainability? Where do you think they are? Oh. I'll just say, I, I think that our congregations are just beginning to think about that. Like they see that's coming ahead of them as an issue. They're not yet thinking what, what are all the factors in sustainability? So it's not really, it has not become a practical issue for them yet. It's just an idea. 
And okay. my own response, I was really thinking like, how can I translate some of these things? Like for instance, at the hub level, continuity of leadership is really, really important. At the congregational level, it's actually really important to have some turnover. Like if one person becomes associated with this project and wants to stay forever, that's not good. You actually want really, uh, you want the energy to keep getting picked up by the next person who's been well prepared to take it on. So like every three years or so, you really want a change. So I'm just trying to think like, I think all of these areas have like just slight tweaks for thinking about what works in a congregation. Right, and, and really uh, within the planning work um, is the whole notion of succession planning, which is what you're talking about, Jane. And, and that's a hard thing to do, especially on a congregation level when you're working with volunteers. But how do you groom people, mentor people, uh, and, and usually they come from the program itself, hopefully. So they're, they have the experience and then they have the leadership capacity as well to take it on. Lisa? Yeah, um, thank you. I, um, I was struck too that as you asked the question that if I just scan across our congregations right now, I think if we were to begin to talk to them in the language of sustainability, they're going to out of love at various to various degrees along the, the COVID anxiety spectrum, they're going to go to the sustaining the congregation level like the anxiety is, are we going to be there tomorrow, the building them all the things we all have been reading and know and following. Um, and in our practice, I think what we're beginning to figure out is how do we help them recognize that the initiative, the thing we're doing with them are actually core practices in being church, right? That they're not a program added to church. They're actually things that are showing some, in our case, at least some, some evidence of, of grounding and sustaining people through this crisis that my hope is we'll then find a way to talk about sustainability of the initiative as they're discerning a mission going for, you know, the, how they're joining God's mission where they are post COVID, whatever that looks like. So, so I'm fascinated by the work we need to do on sustainability or want to do out of Baptized for Life, our initiative, but I'm even more interested in how it could change the language of sustainability or the experience of what a sustainable congregation looks like more broadly. Um, after all of the turbulence of these last four years and then COVID on top of it. Yeah. So that makes, I don't know if that makes sense. I just, I feel like there's a, and it, we, as, as Jane said, well, we're not, we're early in the let's talk sustainability, but if we were to do it today, they would go, I think to, we're, you know, survival language <laughs> and mm -hmm. in many cases. And I think we, we see a way through that that could be more generative, I guess would be my language. You know, Lisa, that's important um, because it really goes circles back to mission of the congregation. Um, there's an article and I can make it available uh, to Jesse to send out to all of you. Um, I think it's called three questions to ask now uh, in this time of COVID. <clears throat> and it, it is a wonderful piece. It, it is beautiful to do with theological reflection. Um, it talks about what have we lost during this time of COVID. And there are obviously multiple levels of loss on the personal level, um, on the family level, and then on the, on the congregational level. And there's some beautiful questions in there that lend themselves to group reflection. Uh, the second major question is, what did we assume that is no longer relevant? For example, we assumed all of us, we would be at the Alexander today uh, doing this work. Uh, and, it, it, you know, I could be moving around and working with you and we could have all kinds of various activities, but this is the best we have. So our assumptions were thrown out the window. And then the third question is really to go deeper and say, what's emerging now as a result of this? And that's where the goodness is. And I think that's where they could circle back and say, our program uh, is contributing to mission, is contributing to congregational vitality, is contributing to our flourishing, and it's keeping us grounded in who we are as uh, people of God. Um, but if you're, I'll, I'll have, I'll make that available, that article, because it's got a number of questions in there that might be helpful to some of your congregations and, and you as a hub. Thank you.
I saw that graph you had of the arrows that were, you know, aligning. Yeah. The, the, these initiatives may end up being valuable in ways we had not intended, and things we thought were going to be useful are not essential. Right, right. You know, even if we weren't in COVID, um, that graph and those questions are still relevant because our lives are changing way too fast. Um, many of us comment, myself included, about how quickly this year has gone by and, you know, the loss of so many things, but also we've gained a lot of things. Uh, we've, we've learned to build relationships in a, in a different way, not the best way, but in a different way. Other questions? How about the rest of you in terms of your congregations? Do you think they're thinking about sustainability? I, I, our congregations have been um, thinking about sustainability mostly in terms of the granting because we required that they think about sustainability in order to get the grant. However, um, two of the things that we did that directly impact state sustainability in our congregations was, first of all, we had our, our first cohort congregations recommend partners in their community to receive mini grants so that we built connections and partnerships towards sustainability. And second, we, um, for that service that they did to us, we gave them many grants in order to relieve the burden of adjusting to the COVID-19 changes so okay. that they were no longer trying to figure out what they were going to do in terms of internet or whatever. Um, they weren't really big. They were $5,000, but it was enough for most of them that it alleviated that immediate need. And they no longer had to figure out what parts of the original grant they were given had to move towards something different in that mm -hmm. sense. Um, however, I think that all of this will make it easier for me to start talking about sustainability and planning in the broader sense. Because I think it mo mostly what sustainability means to them is the existential threat of no longer, you know, being. So um, it'll be interesting. I'd like to work with my first eight churches on how to adapt something like this to their groups and their teams. And mm -hmm. I think I have, I think I have the potential of being able to bring some of the pastors into that and, and really talk about whether this would be useful to their teams. Yeah. And it might be, um, it, it could be an open-ended question before you even engage people in any kind of a tool, like an assessment tool. But how are they describing sustainability? What do they believe is important uh, relative to sustaining their program? What would they need? And try to get them out of the just the funding mentality, which is very important. I'm not diminishing that. But what other elements of their program uh, require some thoughtful conversation about sustainability? Uh, personnel, we've talked about that. Uh, resources, that might be another area. Uh, capacity for space, if once we get out of COVID where people could gather. Uh, and you mentioned another one, Laura, and that would be technology. Uh, many, many groups have um, invested in technology since March. Uh, otherwise they would have lost um, a, a large group of their congregants. I know my parish invested, um, a lot of congregations here in Indianapolis did. So it's technology has become really the way to, to keep people connected, obviously. So what and do you do if there's conflict in the congregation over what's to be sustained and what's to be let go? Because congregations 
uh, might, especially with the pandemic, might not be able to sustain the work that they're doing through this project, you know, at the level that they're doing it. So they got to get rid of something. They have, might have to let go of some things and they have to discern maybe what's essential that they can keep going. But what happens when they have conflict about that? I've never heard of that. <laughs> um, I don't want to call you a liar, but. <laughs> uh, well, I think First of all, who is who are the people who are who are the decision makers? First of all, need to be the who's, who are the people around the table that need to make those kinds of decisions, and what criteria are they going to use to make those decisions? And usually, people make a decision that is more personal or embedded in some opinion, rather than some objective criteria that everyone can agree on. If they can agree on the criteria. Uh, and I, I really encourage groups to look at criteria that um, are connected to mission and values and beliefs, traditions, all those sorts of things. Um, and then really then begin to look at programs that are urgent to the mission, essential to the mission, important to the mission, uh, desirable to the mission, or helpful to the mission, or nice to do. Uh, kind of a rank ordering, if you will, from... Uh, uh, urgent being number five to nice to do being number one. But the first thing is get the criteria right. That might take a longer conversation and a little bit of back and forth. There might be some tension with that as well. If, if people are making decisions just on, on um, opinions or um, uh, perceptions that you are gonna have that ongoing conflict. I was going to make comment um, that for our our congregations, and I think in general, one of the needs for sustainability is relevancy, remaining relevant during and through these times. We know that as an institution for us as African Americans, uh, the church has always been an existential and ontological necessity for our survival and validation as a people and now not being able to congregate or come together, it is such a great void in how we process and engage just being in this country. Um, so looking at the impact of the pandemic and the changes that has brought forth, what is the relevance of the church and how can it be sustained not only for the resources that we've talked about, but being, maintaining a relevance that is meeting the needs, the diverse needs that the congregation, I mean, the community and congregations currently have. Yes, and particularly yes. in the midst of uh, such political, social and racial turmoil. Yeah. What is the role of a congregation? Um, what role does it play in all these kinds of conversations that are going on? Um, and the relevant, I think that's a, a beautiful question to ask um, in terms of what is our role? In, in all of this and really to help people reflect on that. But a, part of it is framing the right questions that people can engage in together, both theologically and spiritually in, in terms of their own tradition. The rest of you, where do you think people are? Our um, congregate, we had just finished kind of um, finalizing proposals and awarding uh, grant funds when the pandemic hit. So most of our churches were just getting started implementing projects that they had spent an entire year discerning and developing, and it kind of took the wind out of their sails. Wow. Um, and some of them have been able to um, conduct things virtually. But some of them have, you know, like for um, one church that was really partnering with a local school to do tutoring and camp and um, reading um, and early intervention with reading, um, there was no way for them to, to even start that. So they, they probably won't start until, you know, early 2021. So I think the sustainability question is, can we even get started? 
um, you know, how will, I think they're thinking more, how will we come back together to, and, and re-energize? And then I think the sustainability question will come once they feel like they can even get off the ground a little bit. Yeah. So, yeah. And I wonder, Kelly, if the role of the hub uh, is to disguise sustainability for just a bit, not even bring up the word because it, you know, they're not ready for that conversation as you're suggesting. Uh, disguise it by um, saying, well, how did this program work? Uh, have you thought about promoting it into a larger audience? Um, or um, what other partners in the community might be interested in doing this or uh, would uh, gain something? Uh, it could be other congregations. Uh, if you could ask those kinds of questions of them as a hub, that would begin uh, the sustainability wheel to really begin to turn a little bit without imposing this theoretical framework that they've got to all of a sudden embrace. Right, because if they're just getting started, then to talk about that, it's almost like it's overwhelming a little bit. Right, um, right. But if you could help them uh, build on their successes, mm -hmm. what's working well, and then say, okay, if that little aspect of your program is working well, then how do we promote it? How do we invite others into it? Um, how do we adapt to it, even though we're still on this this Zoom mentality? Um, I, that would then contribute to sustainability. And then when they get to the question of sustainability, they're going to realize, hey, we've done a lot already. Right. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, I'll go. We, uh, we have been, interestingly enough, receiving um, uh, reports about uh, the way calling has seeped into the culture of our churches. And um, uh, that was a part of our grant proposal. It was creating a culture of calling. And so that's a part of what we were trying to um, help build. And, um, and so for us, I mean, there are plenty of our churches that are struggling through COVID just like any other churches, but um, lots of them are reporting that this theme, this theological theme has been really sustaining them and really helping them to, to get through this in a different way, because all of a sudden they're looking for, well, what is God calling us to right now? Like what, how is that maybe unique and different from what it was before? So it's been pretty rich. Um, and, and just hearing reports of that over and over and over again of, um, we're really, we're really seeing that we don't make decisions about, uh, without thinking about now, what are we being called to now and, and things like that, which, so that's all really good. Um, mm -hmm. And we're celebrating that. However, as I hear you talk, I'm going, oh, but we really need to talk to them then about how do you sustain a culture? Because that's, yeah you know, we're not just talking about sustaining a program, we're talking about sustaining a culture. And that's a slightly different uh, ball of wax, but is doable for us. And we just need to, um, to we've been talking about how to sustain, uh, you know, kind of connection to calling, but I think we need to broaden that even more. So yeah, it's just really helped me think through that um, because there is stuff out there uh, and we can certainly go after that of how to how to sustain culture. Yeah. yeah. And what of the culture, you know, what 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 of the culture has changed or been um, enhanced by right. calling in some way? Right. To really get in touch with that. Um, yeah. It's hard. And then, I think what they're identifying as they go through this, and especially as they go through COVID, where they're going, gosh, before we would have just been lost, and now we have some sense of what we need to be paying attention to. So, uh -huh. yeah, so that's been really gratifying, but but that's not just gonna magically stay. So that's yeah. the sustainability issue. Yeah, and, and people, as you, I think all of us know, are looking, are searching for meaning right now. Uh, what does all this mean? And, and where is God in this? And uh, I, I would think that calling um, this particular initiative really helps that conversation. Other questions or comments?
would you um, be interested in seeing the um, assessment tool after Christmas to really kind of engage in that a little bit? Everybody's nodding their head, okay. <laughs> Um, I think what I'm going to do, uh, Kathleen and Jane, is play around with it. And, and given some of the things that you have offered today, and it's really helped me think it a little bit uh, better, uh, see if we could tailor it to a congregation and maybe just ask some pointed, simple questions rather than giving them some kind of an inventory. Um, but I'd like to give it to you to look at um, just for the purpose of, of whether you think it's of any value, either to you as a hub uh, or to the congregations you're working with. Would that be all right? Good. Yeah, I think that's a great idea. Okay. Yeah. Um, the, the other thing I would offer you um, is that I'm always available to any of you individually uh, to look at your evaluation plans or to look at a congregation's evaluation or, or to answer their questions. That's what the evaluation project and uh, certainly take note of that. Um, it's, it's a service, it's a free service. And uh, I would be delighted to work with any of you oh, and all of you for that matter. <laughs> I know I've worked with Laura. Um, we haven't connected lately, but, and I've, I've worked with Claire on a couple of things, so. So I'd be interested from your perspective and Jessica's perspective, just what you heard from people today, is this pretty consistent what you're hearing with what the Indianapolis Center for Congregations is hearing from your congregations and then other grantees and other grant programs? Or is there anything you'd like to lift up for us today? Um, um, no, I think everybody in this past year at this point has been really trying to adapt uh, to, we did at, at the Center for Congregation, Congregations this year is we had a connect through tech grant initiative. And um, what we offered, and Laura alluded to it as well, we offered congregations in the state of Indiana up to $5,000 to quickly improve their capability in technology so that they could connect immediately with, with their members. And we had an overwhelming response. Um, hundreds of congregations applied for their grant and uh, they were able to improve this kind of online uh, opportunity. Uh, also what they were live streaming, uh, their worship services, that sort of thing. Uh, but to say all that, Kathleen, because it really was about adapting how do we stay connected? How do we build meaningful relationships? How do we help people share faith? How do we help people continue to be a community of faith? Um, and that grant was in part, not totally, but was in part a way to pivot and say, at least for the short term, here's what we can do. And I, I, we're all gonna get back to some kind of normal. It's not gonna be the way it was before because we've learned something about ourselves uh, through all this. Uh, but it really is being nimble and being able to pivot uh, in a time like this, rather than enduring it and saying, oh, woe is us, and, and then look at the fallout as a result, but really saying, how can we adapt so that we can continue uh, to serve people that are part of our community? Great, thanks. Jessica, I'm putting you on the spot. I didn't tell you I was going to ask you that question, but I just kind of wondered if you had any reflections you'd share. Thanks, Kathleen. Yeah, I um, uh, really appreciate, Sue, that emergent chart as well. It, 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 that picture helps me so much to understand what has happened this year. And so thank you for that, uh, the, the framing of sort of, you know, things we have to let go, right? Strategies that we have to let go and strategies that we've welcomed in and now are incorporating in. And I guess what I'd just invite us to do in terms of evaluating and thinking about sustaining, there are certain things you've had to let go for the sake of letting go for this year. And then I think there are things that you're going to want to have that let go curve, maybe dovetail back in, in like a year, right? So you, you incorporated some because we had to, and you had to let go some 
but maybe that other one bends back. Maybe it doesn't. Maybe you let it go completely. But I think for some of us, some of those un some of those things we had to let go because of COVID may dovetail back. And that's where this evaluation piece is so important because what you know, Kathleen and Jane and Jesse and I wanted you to hear from Sue is that you had intentions and a lot of those intentions were really good and they've led you to where you are. You had to adapt this year, but it doesn't mean your original intentions need to be jettisoned or need to be completely thrown out, right? Your intentions were still really good. And th that's what we wanna honor, right? And that's why this is such an important evaluative moment for you as hubs. Um, and as we know, because this double hermeneutic is happening, you know, throughout this entire initiative, right? The work you do as hubs is is something that you can continue to mirror for your congregations as well. So as you're you're having these conversations yourself, and we want to encourage you to pass on what you think is helpful and impactful um, for your congregations. And that's where I would say, you know, what we're learning across initiatives right now is that you know a lot of the questions that Lily Endowment asks people to wrestle with are perennial questions, meaning that they're kind of big. <laughs> and that they're not small. So even COVID can't necessarily rattle the big questions. There's a, there's a through line, right? Um, and so I just invite you to return to the, to, to the core, return to that which is um, of gospel, of God, of, of the convictions that you all are carrying into this work faithfully, um, and to help your congregations claim that as well. Um, I love hearing that this is saturating deeply into the core of your, your theological uh, convictions of your own hub and your own organization, and that you're seeing evidence that that's happening uh, to change culture, to change the ethos, to begin, not even to maybe change, but to deepen, right? To deepen and artic bring to articulation things that we haven't said out loud, right? Um, so I want to encourage you all to, 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 to keep reflecting on that good work and reflecting on that, that, that uh, leaning in uh, uh, to what the moment has given us to see clearly um, and, and the ways in which we'll need to um, continue to remember and recall the things that we committed to at the beginning. Um, and that's the, the faithful work as we go ahead. So, but thank you all. This has been wonderful to hear the things you're doing. Thanks. Uh, five more minutes left. If anybody has a question, going once, going twice. <laughs> I don't. This is not a question, but it's a thought. Um, and it goes back to what Lisa was saying earlier about if we talk about sustainability to congregations, they'll think we're talking about their, their total sustainability, not about their, this particular aspect of their life. But I think a really good thing about talking sustainability within this limited sphere is that it actually will teach congregations some practices for thinking about their larger scale sustainability. And that's really great. Like who are their partners? And, um, you know, I'm looking at some of the other, oh, how do they carry out evaluation, which they sometimes like to put off doing. So, so there may be a side benefit. Yeah. You know, and Jane, as you said that, it comes to mind, I should have said this earlier to all of you, um, when you think about sustainability, it's sometimes uh, what you learn from all of that, from your evaluation work in particular, can grow another kind of program as a result. Mm -hmm. You'll see a need that emerges within the group, uh, within this particular program, that says, oh, it looks like now we can spin off something else that is very important to a particular group, for example, like young adults or, or women or... Um, young children, whatever it might be. Yeah, no, I think that's right, Sue. I think, you know, this whole thing has always been framed as an experiment. So I think we all imagined that congregations were going to, you know, choose some particular group or topic or issue or someplace in the congregation that they were going to explore these issues around calling. And that as a sign of sustainability might be they're going to do it again, but with another focus right. or another group or take an idea that they heard from other congregations or from their hub team. Absolutely. So that's another way that the work kind of would spill over or um, can we use the word infect other parts of the community or no, that's bad, that was a bad <laughs> joke. Just. <laughs>
Well, thank you all, Kathleen. Oh. Thank you for inviting me into this group. It's always a joy to be with you. Uh, yeah, thanks, Sue. We can't be together, but all right. Well, we'll see you in January, and you'll send us those materials, and we'll yes. get them out to everybody. So I'll, I'll send Very a link fun. to this article, and um, I'll, we'll get the. Thank you all. <laughs>